All right. Tell me when you're when we're ready. Oh, let me get that clock. Were you? Oh, okay. Thanks. Were you going to do the whole service or me? Oh no, I was. Uh, if you're okay with doing yeah, the rest, yeah. Okay. I'll just... I just saw something announced to you for you to announce. So I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, he might. It might have just been generic. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're good to go. Just give me like a put a hand up when we're good to go. Okay. All right, well, let me start by praying and I'll get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we pray that you would help settle our hearts and our minds to focus on your word and the glory that comes through your word. That we would not just go through the motions today, but that we would come into your presence and into your courts with praise and with the expectation to gain from your means of grace. So please send us your spirit now to illuminate your word and to help us to understand in this class uh, your works of creation and providence. Be glorified in all that we think about and all that we cover. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're up to question eight of the, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and that is this question. How doth God execute his decrees? And the answer is, God executeth his decrees in the works of creation and providence. So obviously very closely associated with what we talked about last week, not just but unpacking what we talked about last week. And of course there was loose ends last week, and I'm aware of that, and so uh, the notes are shorter today partly so that we can circle back to those two uh, applications from last week, namely um, the freedom of the will and what about evil, um, which we did brush up on those, but especially the freedom of the will, I kind of just said, you know, go, go read Jonathan Edwards, and, <laughs> and I wasn't trying to, um, just we, we lacked time, so, uh, so we can circle back to that at, at the end of today. Um, but again, today, if we don't get too deeply into what we're talking about today, the good news is the questions that follow in this catechism continue to unpack that. So there's a question on creation, there's a question on providence, so uh, we'll get to go deeper. Here we're really just defining terms. There are big terms, they're they're deep things, uh, but that's the answer, and those are the uh, some of the verses, uh, all of which we'll we'll mention at some point today, uh, the verses that the Westminster Divines use. And so here's where we're going, uh, two points. So we're looking at the decree of God again last week, just to remind you. If we float back and forth between the language of decree singular and decrees plural, it's because, uh, strictly speaking, there is one singular decree. On the other hand, analogically speaking, just because we're stuck with the limits of human language, it's perfectly appropriate to talk about the decrees of God because that's how it's going to first come to us as we ask questions like, well, did God cause this, or is God involved in this, and so forth. And so we speak about uh, particular instances. And so it's very natural and normal to talk about the decrees of God. We then come back up and realize that God is not um, subjected to the story in such a way that as the author, he is continuing to refactor in, that he sort of has the heavenly GPS and he's recalculating depending on wrong turns that we take and things like that. Um, So as long as we have that in mind, it's fine to use the word decrees in the plural. And in this case, we're dividing it between uh, creation and providence. So a little bit of review from last week. We'll recall that one way of dividing um, divine causality is between, and unfortunately I don't have as many charts as I did last week, Uh, So sorry if this gets deep at first, but you'll remember um, the difference between efficient versus permissive causality last week, and I brought that up in the context of that question about evil, the problem of evil. And that's only one uh, implication of, of the larger category between primary causation and secondary causation. And the picture we used last week was the picture of a circle, and inside of that circle represented all things. And so God is the primary cause. The only kind of cause that's outside of that circle is God. And we called that primary causation. 
all other causes that you can possibly think about, we called secondary causation, and that's inside the circle. This is the way the Westminster Confession speaks. It's the way Christian theologians spoke for 20 centuries, primary versus secondary causation. Secondary causation is not unreal or not meaningful. In fact, you need there to be a primary cause in order for the secondary causes to exist in the first place. And we used examples like the pool player uh, playing pool and what causes the eight ball to go in the corner pocket. And we realized it was about five or six or more right answers you can give to that. And all of them will be talking about secondary cause. And at least on that level, the actor, the pool player, was the efficient or primary cause in that sense. But of course, as you step back from the trees to the forest of all things, God atheism. There would be many ultimate causes, which, as far as we know, wouldn't have any connection to each other. Who would be the head honcho in that pantheon of gods between the one we've been calling God and your free will and the devil and all these other things that we're, we're attributing ultimate cause to? The biblical worldview knocks all of that out and says, no, there's only one ultimate cause. There's only one God. If you believe in God at all, you believe in this idea of primary causation, and there's only one. All others are on the level of secondary cause, okay? So you can see it matters what you believe in the rest of your worldview to be consistent as a theist at all. So if you don't believe in this picture of God's total sovereignty over all things, you really don't consistently believe in God. Uh, R.C. Sproul did that one time in a classroom, uh, not just to get under people's skin, but to make that point is to get people thinking consistently, and, and basically said, hey, do you all, how many people here believe in God? Raise your hand. And of course, everybody raised their hand. It was a seminary classroom. It wasn't a, uh, a secular university or anything. So everybody raised their hand. And he said, um, okay, let me ask you a second question. How many of you believe, and I can't remember the form of the question, but it was about God's sovereignty, that God causes all these things and stuff like that. And he had only, you know, half the people, or I think it was less. I think it was something like some paltry uh, 20% or less of, of the people raised their hand. And so Sproul said, well, uh, everybody that uh, left your hands down for the second question should have left your hands down to the first question too. And of course, they all started uh, huffing and puffing and whatnot. But his point was, is that you, you can't consistently believe in God unless you believe in this sovereign God who is, um, who is behind all things that ever come to exist. And so that's what we're talking about. Um, we were talking about last week when we talked about all that stuff about efficient cause and, and, uh, and permissive cause coming from that. Well, what question eight does is it takes up the same issue of God's decree and it divides them on the larger storyboard of nature and history. And you can just see by those two points what I mean by that. And the most simple way to come to this understanding, and I could have made a picture for this too, but it's, it's so simple I could describe it. It's actually too simple. Uh, to handle more scrutiny or to be able to anticipate other questions that can come up. And that, that would be sort of, a, I could draw a picture of sort of an explosion on the left, on a timeline. Let there be. Poof, Genesis 1-1, you know? And then and call that creation. And I could put all of Genesis 1 and 2 in there. Uh, special creation of the world, special creation of man. There's a series of let there be, let there be, let there be. But then in Genesis 2-1... God stops from his works in that sense, and that raises questions about what that means and doesn't mean. And then the rest of the picture would just be in this line, going from left to right, this arrow off into the future. And I call that providence. And both of those words and both of those concepts and those activities of God are primarily, before they're anything else, they're primarily acts of God. They are, they are the two... Uh, aspects of the divine decree, that he is causing them. And it's not like creation is his strong causality. And then providence, uh, what's a good uh, metaphor for this? Like fireworks, I guess, going off in the night sky where it just sort of diffuses, whereas the timeline goes more from left to right, that his power of let there be is sort of echoing or diffusing. You understand what I'm saying? It's like weakening out. That's not what providence means. Like, providence is like, a, is like a weaker, you know, an afterthought. Yeah, he's there, but not so much. Like, not like breathing down your neck. 
not really causing all things. But that's not the picture that the Bible paints, as we saw last week. So let's get first to the, the decree of creation. And the, and the pictures this week are much simpler. Because all we're doing, and we're going to fill them out in the weeks to come when, when there's particular questions on creation, a particular question on providence. Right now, we're just looking, them, looking at them as aspects of God's decree. So when I say that, keep in, in mind God's Word. And here I don't mean His revealed Word, though we find out about it in His revealed Word. Here we mean God's decreeing Word, His causing Word, His creating Word. So that picture just shows God's decree, and I have those words, let there be, and then that circle is still going to represent the same thing. Everything in that circle is everything outside of God, everything that comes to be, which is everything besides God. And he creates that ex nihilo. Now, when you get to providence, and even really before you get that, even when you start analyzing the nature of things he made, things in the universe, animals on day six, whatever it is, already you, you may start to you know, ask about primary and secondary causation. That's fine. So we have to define this idea of what creation ex nihilo means. And that, if, you know, if you're not familiar with the phrase, it's a Latin phrase. It just means from nothing or out of nothing. And even that is, uh, if you hear it in a certain way, it can create some controversy. But on the most basic level, it just means out of nothing or from nothing. Um, this idea of creation ex nihilo draws attention, again, to the aseity of God, that attribute uh, that speaks about God's self-sufficiency, that he is independent. So in all that God is and all that God does, he doesn't borrow. He's not dependent. He's not potential where he is acted upon, and then out of that, he is stimulated or whatever it is to cause whatever he causes. No, out of his mind and by his word, all things and the nature or anything potential that those things could be come from him without remainder. And so the doctrine of creation is very important for the aseity of God, the self-sufficiency of God. We can have a doctrine of creation or a doctrine of God's causality that actually undermines God's self-sufficiency if we have him borrowing from anything else to the least degree. Here's a couple of verses that speak about God creating in this sense of his spoken word. In Psalm 33, 6, it speaks about him speaking, and them, namely his works, coming to be. Uh, Revelation 4.11 we'll look at in detail later, but it's this worship scene in heaven, the same thing. It, it mentions by his word and by his will all things were created. So this imagery of his word and his will are operative, but it's very important that when we hear God's word creating, that this is not some metaphor it's analogical speaking, of course, because we don't mean that he has um, sound waves or that he has a mouth or that there's any sequence. All the things that would be involved in our speaking out of things that are in our mind, there, there's a sequence there. God doesn't suffer from any of those sequences of change or learning or his voice getting raspy, as mine does every Sunday. N none of that stuff is what we mean. So there is, there is an analogical sense here, but it's not a metaphor. It really means that God's word, his decree, is the cause of all things. Now, there's, there's a lot, probably a lot of objections, but two main objections to this doctrine of creation ex nihilo, and unsurprisingly, they're, they're pretty much the same as the two main objections to the Trinity. It ain't in the Bible, and it doesn't make sense, or, or it's not biblical, and it's illogical. Uh, these are the, the two objections that will come against this. Um, first, and, and what people will say by it's not biblical, I think it's sort of, sort of a passive-aggressive way to argue this. Some people will say, isn't that doctrine just something that came from the early church fathers? Isn't it just sort of this intrusion of Greek philosophy and stuff like that? And so they won't straight up say, show me that in the Bible. Because we can show them in the Bible. We already have. Um, but we have to understand what we mean. 
When people speak like that, when less orthodox scholars, because they're not orthodox theologians that speak like that, what they're saying is that this idea of creation ex nihilo, creation by God's word, is an alien intrusion. This involves philosophical categories and language that's coming in to this discussion. And we want to say this is not the invention of an idea. You know, when theologians um, come up with new language or use words that are foreign to us, and they might look like big words, maybe Greek or Latin words or whatever else, they're not inventing a doctrine out of midair. What they're doing is they're clarifying or articulating something that wolves have come in to the sheep pen and have created ambiguity or have created innovation or have just in some way muddied up the waters or come up with something new. And because of the heretics' new words and new language formulations or these challenges, Orthodox theologians are forced to put up clearer lines of, of, or sorry, clearer signs at the the edge of the sheep pen, if that makes sense. Um, And so in a sense, uh, heretics kind of do the church a favor. You know, in God's providence, he uses those things to help clarify Christian truth uh, because of these controversies come up. And so the early church fathers came up with this phrase, of course, the words ex nihilo or out of nothing are not in that exact word pattern in the Bible. But as we saw, there are other passages that do say this. Let me show you two other key verses for how this is a thoroughly biblical idea, just to get a sense of what it really means. Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So there you have it flatly said, it's created by the Word of God. And then you have this this qualification of what that rules out. So all the stuff you can see, all the stuff that's in the visible world, all the things that you can sense, all the things that science studies, those are not the origin of this universe. It's not to diminish them. It's not to say that what science does is not important or valuable. It is simply to say that creation was not God borrowing from things that were already there. It is creation and not craftsmanship. He's not taking what is already there. And that was an important point in the Greek philosophical world because they believed that the universe was eternal, that its matter had already been there. It had always been there. Uh, Here's another verse, Romans 4.17, which isn't talking about the act of creation at the beginning in a sense, but watch what it does say. Uh, Paul roots God's creative activity over Abraham's lifeless body. When he's fulfilling the promise to Abraham, he uses this language. He speaks of God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So that's the ex nihilo part. He calls into existence by his word things that do not exist. He doesn't use his word to command or reform things that already do exist. Now, he does that too. But what Paul's saying is that what fulfilled the promise for Abraham and created that baby for Sarah was a miracle, was a promise. Now, it's not the same thing as the virgin birth. But he is saying that God fulfilled the promise of Isaac, and in general, the offspring. He fulfilled the promise of the covenant in the same way and with the same power that he did in creating the entire universe. That's going to become important as a concept for the new birth in 2 Corinthians 4.6. I don't have this in my notes, but um, Paul uses that as a grounding for the new birth, for the new creation. He, He says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Now, what's he referring to there? Paul's pointing back to the original creation. Let there be light. For the same God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul is comparing the new birth and the creation of Christians to the creation of everything else. 
That same God who said, let there be light, is the same God who says, let there be a Christian. Let there be a new heart. Let there be a new creation. And so this is an important doctrine for understanding how salvation works. This is an important doctrine for understanding why preaching works, why evangelism works, why simply being faithful to the content of the gospel works, because we can trust in the creative power of God. So that's what creation ex nihilo means, that God does not borrow. He speaks into existence whatever he wants. Second objection, doesn't make sense. Creation ex nihilo is illogical, they say, because it violates the principle, and, and here's some more Latin for you, but there's a song for it in pop culture, but it's uh, ex nihilo nihil fit, from nothing or out of nothing, nothing comes. I sort of intuitively know that, right? Um, now, a lot of mo modern scientists, unfortunately, don't know that anymore, at least those that would adhere to the doctrine of self-creation. Well, it just created itself. Well, that would be illogical. Because then it, whatever it is, would have to be there to create itself and not be there at the same time and in the same relationship. And that's a violation of the law of non-contradiction. And I think what people are hearing is that when they hear creation ex nihilo, what they hear is us saying that God made self-creation to be a thing. Just because. Because he's God. He can do that. That's not what we're saying. That's not what the words ex nihilo mean. In fact, uh, no less a uh, reformed classicalist, if I can call him that, John Gerstner himself maintained the absurdity of even God bringing something out of non-being. Now, uh, somebody brought this to my attention, and I looked back at it, and, and Gerstner even uh, cited Jonathan Edwards on this as well. But it seems to me that... Uh, I'm not sure who Gerstner was criticizing, like what, uh, what early church father was using this language, but I think an equivocation is going on here in terms of, of those, those words. We're not saying that God is the one being who can violate the law of non-contradiction and make something come out of nothing in this sense, that what they're hearing is that the nothing, you ever watch, uh, I just came to my mind. There's a movie in the 80s called uh, The Never-Ending Story. You ever see that? Anybody? It was a science fiction book before that. But anyway, there was this thing called The Nothing that was eating up the whole universe. Kind of like the second law of thermodynamics, except this very sinister one that actually didn't just create disorder, but like ate things up, and it was eating up the whole universe. Anyway, it's a corny plot line. But uh, <laughs> I think that's what uh, people are hearing that when we say creation ex nihilo or out of nothing, that, it, that God is using the nothing. That's not what the phrase has meant among classical theologians. It's meant instead simply that he did not borrow, that he is not dependent, that he is speaking it into existence, that he forms all of its constituent parts, all of its elements, everything that you can think of that belongs to secondary causation God, poof, makes it be um, by the power of his word. And so we're saying that, that that is the kind of power that his word has. So some of, the, some of these objections, you, we simply have to ask ourselves, wait a minute, how are they hearing this word? Is that really what the word means? And, and here it's referring to God's independence in the act of creation. Well, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, uh, <clears throat> nihilo uh, was important in the early church because it drew a sharp contrast between the biblical view, not just of creation, but the biblical uh, view of God. Again, this shapes how you think of God. Between that and the prevailing worldviews at that time, Greek materialism on the one hand, but there was other Greek ideas that were there that kind of ro <clears throat> rose above materialism, and one of them came from Plato, and I won't bore you with Plato, but what happened during the first century is there's sort of a revival of Plato, the Neoplatonists, and this is where Gnosticism comes from. The idea here is that spirit or invisible, immaterial reality is the more real reality. We agree with that. But for Plato, he believed that the material world was a prison that if there was a salvation at all, 
It was by ascending by intellectual reflection, by the life of the philosopher, to this immaterial realm, to this realm of the forms or essences, justice, beauty, goodness, truth, things that we would agree must be eternal. We say they're attributes of God, and we can, we can show that. But later on, by the first century, this Neoplatonism came around, and one of the problems with original Platonism, and the reason it was criticized by Aristotle and it fell out of favor, was because Plato had no explanation for how this world came to be to begin with. He said, well, that's great. There's these forms up there at eternity, goodness, justice, and all that stuff. That's great. We would agree with you that much. How did this world come to be? Is that just some impersonal, abstract bunch of essences? Plato had an answer for that. He believed that there was this kind of God he called the Demiurge, who, when he created the world, looked outside of himself for those forms, and he patterned the world after these eternal forms. So there is justice down there and injustice because it conforms to the just. There are good things and bad things down there because they conform to the good. There's beautiful things and ugly things down there because they conform to beauty, so on and so forth. Okay, we agree that they conform to that, but you didn't answer the question. How does that create it? And and his answer is insufficient for several reasons we're not going to get into. By the time you get to the first century, this idea became known, this, this, this God of theirs, there was no personal relationship between you and this God, they just called it the one. The one, okay? <laughs> and so the way things came to be, this whole universe of angelic beings and even Christ, and so this is where Gnosticism comes from, is this idea of what one of their main philosophers, Plotinus, he called emanations. So The difference between the creation and this one is not an utter difference where he spoke and it's utterly different than him. He's not even a person. But it sort of emanates like light from the sun, like light beings, and there's levels and so on, these emanations. So the Christian worldview had to do battle not only with Greek materialism, but this newer kind of Greek immaterialism, this this, uh, Neoplatonic idea. And the doctrine of creation was saying several things, and one of them, and the most important thing was, no, there is an utter distinction between the creator and the creation. They're not just differences of degrees, but it's a difference of kind. There are attributes of this God that are incommunicable, that the creature does not have in any sense. And this doctrine of creation, properly understood, becomes sort of a, a barrier in our mind, and a a wall and a distinction between what is not God and what is God. So our doctrine of creation is essential. Now, as you're thinking about this, one of the questions, we asked this about the Trinity, we'll ask this about this, is this idea of creation ex nihilo, is this an essential doctrine? So like if I didn't know about this, or if I don't know what you're talking about, or what if I just don't get it, or what if I say, nah, I don't think so. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? Or, or does that, do you have to believe this to be a Christian? Because I think a lot of the, what people sometimes mean by, is it essential? And um, one of the things I want to do is say, look, um, there's a big difference between a doctrine being essential to the truth versus you need to know this to have saving faith. We're not saying that you need to know this to have saving faith. But if this doctrine is not true, you've got a different worldview. You've got a different God. You've got a different gospel. So it's actually very important in that sense. I'll read a couple more scriptures, and then we'll just briefly touch on providence. Doctrine of creation has to be comprehensive with respect to space and res- respect to time. To space, Isaiah 40, 26 says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings them out, oh, sorry, he who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. There he's talking about the stars, and that was important to talk about because in the ancient world, a lot of people worshipped stars and invested supernatural powers in stars. Think of astrology and things like that. And so the Bible is everywhere showing God's sovereignty over the stars. Our doctrine of creation has to be comprehensive with respect to time. Notice the ongoing, the present dimension of God's decree causing things like the weather. Psalm 148, verse 8, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. I purposely left that in there. There's a difficult one this week. Uh, Tornadoes in Kentucky. Um, One county um, in particular, um, 
quite a few people died. So do you believe this? And, and, and that's where you have to believe this, in those tough moments where it's not just this academic thing. Uh, but I can tell you this, and I know this is not about the problem of evil, but the, the comfort that people attempt to get by saying that God wasn't there, God didn't know, God's hands were tied, God would have wanted to do something about it, but he could. When we talk like that, um, that is not a lasting comfort. That may, be, that may numb the pain for the moment, but in the end, the questions are, well, then what sense is there? Grows and grows and grows and gnaws because the question has not been answered. So we do want to say that God is sovereign over these things and, and knows about it. Um, there's a lot of other things I could say in here about creation. Um, I'll skip that to get to providence quickly just because of the time. Providence is about God causing, let's go to that one, all things to come to pass after that. Right? So think of Genesis 50.20. Let me give you these two verses. Genesis 50.20, which I mentioned in passing last week, but I didn't get into it. And then Romans 8.28. And I want to give people, whenever they want to quote those verses as they should want to quote them, I want to give everybody the, the Genesis 50.20 and Romans 8.28 test. And the test is this. If God says to Joseph's brothers, what you meant, sorry, he says it through Joseph. Joseph is the one saying it, but you get the idea. If he can say what God meant, sorry, back up one more time, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Here's the test. How can God mean it for good if he did not mean it at all? Does that make sense? There's a psalm that refers back to that event and says that God is the one who caused the famine, that caused the family to go down to Egypt. He was behind all of it. But their evil actions were an actor. And we resolved some of that last week. We'll come back to it when we get to providence in particular. But then the Romans 8.28 test. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Same question. How can God cause all things for good if God does not cause all things at all? You can't have it both ways. You can't take the comfort from it if you don't believe in it, there's an it there. And the it there in both of those places is that God is causing all things, that he is ordaining all things, that he has decreed through even the evil actors we saw last week, Acts 2, 23, and Acts 4, 27, and 28. The evil actors and cons conspirators against Christ at the cross that God had ordained all of that, and he was using that for his glory and for our greatest good. And so, yes, everywhere from Genesis 2-1 onward, in that sense, is this thing called providence, but it is not some lower-geared or automatic pilot form of creation. And so I have this picture that I think is, is not that the timeline picture would be wrong. The timeline picture would be true. It would be telling us part of the truth. But what we want to say is that pick an event, any event, or we can make a smaller circle inside of that event, because some events are very complex. Like, what are the causes to World War I? I don't, you know, write whole books about it. There's many good answers. What's the cause to you picking the cereal that you did this morning versus some other breakfast? That's easier. I can handle that. But even there, you can make circles inside of that circle, that event called you choosing that cereal. And, and, and some of those circles being, because I, I wanted to be healthier, or the other way, because I wanted the chocolatey one, or whatever. And, and, and there would be smaller causes inside of that. And this gets into the answer to free will. Do we believe in free will? Absolutely. You can do exactly what you most want to do. Given all that you know to do, according to what you most desire, through the series of subordinate causes that you currently at this moment believe will bring you to that end, given your habits, many of which go against that, and your genetic structure, and your habituation, and your available options, and I want to jump to the moon. Do you have the ability to do it? Are you a being such as it has the nature to jump to the moon? You can want to jump there all you want. 
You see the problem? What you're going around romantically calling free will is a, is a figment of a matter. It has nothing to do with reality. By free will, I mean the ability to do or do otherwise. Okay, I'm following with you so far. With no inclination toward one choice versus the other choice. Well, that's where you lost me. That's a child's version, at best, of free will. So uh, there's a lot more you can say about that. But no, we don't believe in a free will that is utterly uncaused. That wipes the slate clean every time it makes a choice and engages in an infinite series of acts of self-creation, which we just said is a violation of the law of non-contradiction. What do I mean by free will? Oh, I mean that I can choose anything I want without any causes, without any nature, without any necessity, pulling me to one versus the other. Oh, so you believe that every time a human being chooses, it's another act of self-creation, that your will was there and not there at the same time and in the same relationship before each act. That is logical nonsense. That's not a thing, and it cannot be a thing. And that's what they're going around calling libertarian free will. I can do a whole thing about that, but I said that's why you've got to read Edwards, because he'll, he'll break it down, and it's hard to get at when you just give a, a sort of a minute version. But we'll have a lot to say about providence, and I'll resist the urge to say it all now, because there's going to be a question about creation and a question about providence that allows us to um, zoom in the lens more and see what all this covers. Uh, and we'll get, we'll, we'll talk about, when we talk about providence, we'll talk about things like concurrence, dual agency, that you have God's cause and you have the secondary cause, whatever it is, it's an event in history or if it's a natural occurrence like the tornado or whatever else. And we'll talk about this idea of concurrence with respect to providence. Um, but I will wait on all of that and for now just um, open it up to questions. Yes. How do you comfort a non-believer in, in a loss, say a woman who's lost a baby or something? I mean, Romans eight twenty eight doesn't read for, for them. Yeah. Um, one, one main thing that would apply to believers and unbelievers, and of course it, it, it's going to sound like a cop-out to even the believers, maybe, sometimes, but to unbelievers for sure, and that is we don't know. Um, there is a tendency among the Reformed to say, well, we do know one thing, because I think, I think they're on guard against false hope, which you want to be on guard against false hope. But sometimes that um, can come to mean that we want to emphasize that all are born sinful, which is true. But that can be a distinct question from whether God and His grace... Uh, for example, there's an entire section... Uh, question in the Canons of Dort on the salvation of infants of believers. And they say, well, that's believers, though. That's not unbelievers. But then we have to start asking questions, well, what makes the difference? And um, you can start to make arguments from the covenant. Now, the moment you do that, you're, you're going beyond Scripture. If you want to go to Scripture, you can point to passages like uh, Samuel, where David says about his son that he lost, that he will go to him, to be with him where he is. But you still say, well, yeah, but that's a believer. Um, then you start to point to other things, such as Jesus' attitude toward the children in Luke 18, or God's general way of saving that which is lowly and despised and weak in the world in 1 Corinthians 1. Even when I cite those scriptures, I'm going beyond scripture because I'm making inferences from them that are not there. Um, now, what I'm saying is true about those scriptures, but how I'm putting them together goes, I and mean, I circle back to, I don't know. But that's not all I say. Then I want to say that we, then we trust in the goodness and the wisdom of God. And I don't just mean that in some blank um, Pithy way. I mean, uh, and depending on who I'm talking to, you may have to start getting into some of the elements of the problem of evil 
or they may not in any way be bringing it up. So you're talking about somebody who's actually suffered a loss, maybe recently. And maybe they're not being belligerent like some skeptic that maybe hasn't lost anybody, but they're just bringing up the question in a philosophical way. And, and for them, you want to unpack what you mean by the goodness and the wisdom of God. And that actually, if you don't believe in a good God, you have no grounds to condemn him, who doesn't exist anyway on, on your view, for doing something that doesn't measure up to something that doesn't exist anyway on your view. So, um, if it's an unbeliever, um, there's no escaping getting into just the rest of um, drawing them into a conversation about the gospel. And it'll depend on who it is. I mean, obviously, there's some people who are not ready to hear any of that. And you, you do a lot of listening and tell them you pray for them. Um, so, anyway. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you. I, I should do that more often. That question was, um, what would we say to an unbeliever who has lost a child? So there it's not even a believer, but an unbeliever who's lost a child. Um, because, and that fits in here with the, we're saying that God decrees everything that comes to pass. And we show that from Scripture. And that includes, um, and, and the verses we looked at were about evil people doing evil things uh, willfully. We saw how that fits in. What about natural disasters like that example or the tornado this week where you don't have persons acting evilly that cause it, but you have natural things. And so there we're, we'll say a lot of what we said already, but we'll also bring in things about the nature of this world under the curse and under sin. There's no, there's no easy answers to this. There are, there are good answers that cover a lot. Um, and that sufficiently answer the question to direct us back to trusting in God's goodness. But they're, not, but they're not easy on the mind. In other words, there's no way to talk about them without getting into these deeper categories. Um, and I find that the majority of people that bring this up, they're, they're posing it as if it's a logical, uh, philosophical problem. But you know that somewhere behind that is some pain. And so, some, and so in most cases, it's not somebody that's lost a child or whatever this week. It's some pain from their past. And, and what they're doing now is they're working that out, or they have over the, over the years, they've worked that out into this whole cynical and skeptical view. But yet they're bringing it to you as if it's a philosophical problem. It, it's, it's, it's the hardest part of apologetics, not because it's the most intellectually taxing um, subject, but it's because there's, a, there's an unfairness to it where there's a pastoral pain problem behind it, but you're always getting it as a logical problem. And you know that you can smack down the logical problem because their argument doesn't, cannot hold up logically. But if you do that, you're poking them where it hurts. And so this sort of dare, even if they don't know that they're doing that, that's the effect that it has. So it's, it's a difficult part of, uh, of apologetics and, and witnessing to people is dealing with the problem of evil for that reason. But anyway, yep. I keep thinking about the scripture that says we are saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. And it's not of ourselves, but a gift from God. Yeah. And it's just all you can do when you realize that is thank him really appreciate him and do everything in your life. Jesus, he died a horrible death. Yeah. And he had faith. And he said, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. And I think in a lot of ways, we are so grateful to God for that we love him and know him personally, but also that I think a lot is expected from us. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and that would be to be willing to give our lives like Jesus did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, um, I'm trying to figure out how much time I have left here. Um, if there's one more quick question, I can take it, but otherwise, yes. <laughs> Talking about, um, you know, why did, why did he 
that things happen to good people. <laughs> yeah. Did Jesus answer that in a way? He brought the example of the tower falling mm -hmm. on people, and it was kind of like we all deserve punishment because we're yeah. all sin, but there's only God's goodness and grace. I forget how he worded it. Yeah. In, uh, that somewhere in the scripture? It is. Uh, Luke 13. And, and he uses two examples, the Tower of Siloam falling and then the... The blood of the sac uh, that uh, the blood of the people that Pilate had killed mingled with the sacrifice. So he killed these worshippers that were worshiping in the temple, and he had them killed. So these two examples Jesus uses, and you're right. That is, um, I've used that example before, but I've always wanted to preach a sermon on Luke 13 in an apologetics or maybe a college atmosphere, because it is an answer to the problem of evil. And Jesus is not denying that. Um, that there, so the formulation, why do bad things happen to, to good people? Um, we understand what's wrong with that. Uh, it, was, it was actually a rabbi, an unbelieving rabbi that, that wrote that book. Um, we understand what's wrong with that. But we're not saying that there's not a, a, a correct usage of the word innocent, like in wartime, killing innocents like children or something. There's relative innocence in that sense, non combat We're not denying that. Having said that and gotten that out of the way, you're right. That's, that's the right interpretation. Jesus is saying, in effect, Jesus is not answering their question the way they want it to. Um, he's saying, and the punchline, is, and he says it twice for both of the examples, he says, do you think that they were worse sinners than you? And his next line in both cases is, but no, but I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And so he's, he is saying that those things are a manifestation of God's wrath in this lifetime. And he's not saying that, therefore, everybody that had that tragedy happen to them, they weren't saved. He's not saying that. But this is a manifestation of God's wrath in this time. And what, we, what these things ought to make us think is about the shortness of life and about the justness of God's wrath and the fact that we will stand before him very, very, very soon. And so Jesus is driving even the problem of evil to judgment day and to the need for um, repentance and faith. So, yeah. Let me, uh, let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time of study. We pray that it would be um, retained by us, that uh, you would help us to understand these things further as we reflect on them, and that we would continue to learn more and all for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.